Hi there. Today we'll look at super masks in superposition again. So this is part two of this paper by Mitchell Wurtzman and Vivek Ramanujan. And here's the reason why there's a part two. So after yesterday's video on this paper, I, I like I couldn't sleep because I really felt that I had left out some important aspects that I wanted to touch on during the video. Now, sometimes during videos, I I'll look at the clock and I'll realize like, oh, crap, the video is already like an hour long. And <laughs> I know people are watching on 2x speed anyway, uh, but still it's like too long and I need to wrap it up really soon. And what I felt were pretty important messages about this paper got lost. So specifically, I want to address three different things. First of all, they have like a formal analysis, um, not a formal, but a, a kind of more rigorous analysis of what their modified G objective does. And I also want to give some intuition in that because I felt I felt I really hadn't done a good job at that. Uh, the second part is that um, the the two different ideas right here being the super masks and the superposition. And I, I think mm, my opinion is sort of that these are two separate things. And they really have nothing to do with each other. And I think that didn't really come through last video. And the third one being the broader impact statement of this paper, which I, you know, I usually kind of gloss over it and go like, haha, but I here there is an important point to it. So um, yeah, we'll get to that. All right. So Again, um, not a new paper today, I realize this, but I think it's worth kind of diving deeper into this paper, which is a very cool paper. Um, you know, so so don't don't get me wrong right here. And I, I feel mostly I haven't done a good part at explaining it, like <laughs> literally lying awake. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the first point. Um, we, we had this. So if you hadn't seen the first video, uh, super mass and superposition basically says that uh, we want to do lifelong learning. And we want to do lifelong learning by um, lifelong learning is the task where you have a bunch of tasks in sequence, and you learn them in sequence. So one after the other. And basically, the, the goal is to not forget tasks, uh, once new, you learn new tasks. And this model does it by always building one of these super masks for each task that is applied to the same randomly initialized base neural network uh, each time. And you know, by by keeping the super mask around, you won't forget the task. And then at inference time, uh, if you're given the task, you can just retrieve the mask. If you're not given the task, you can do this superposition trick where you apply all the masks in a superposition. And then you look at sort of the gradient of an entropy function in order to decide which task reduces the entropy the most. So which task is the most certain about a um, particular data point, and that you you kind of infer that that's the task you're going to go with. Um, so instead of the entropy, which is, you know, well reasoned, they had this other objective they call a G and G basically looks at the it's really strange, it looks at the superfluous neurons. So they also add these superfluous neurons, these S neurons right here. And um, they, they, the G objective will only look at the S neurons in order to decide whether or not that's the correct task. And it's basically just the log sum exp of the S neurons. And we had some intuition about them being, you know, all small and so on them being like outlier detectors. But there is an entire chapter in the appendix where the authors do a sort of more in depth theoretical analysis of that, which, you know, I, it, it's not not necessary to do this for them. So I really enjoy, um, I enjoyed reading that. And that gave me sort of the better intuition of what this G objective does. So uh, here they say, the aim is not to formally prove properties of the algorithm. Rather, we hope that a more mathematical language may prove useful in extending intuition. Okay. So again, that's that's pretty cool. So they start off by saying, you have your neural network is basically w. And um, the the sorry, the it's, it's this uh, phi right here. And the w are the last layers weights, which compute your logits. So y is going not to be your class, but y is going to be your logits. And p is going to be the probability vector over your class, 
which if the, you calculate this via a softmax is going to be the following expression right here. If you have a mask, right, um, then at least in the last layer, you can, in, you can infer it as this right here. So you multiply the mask by the last these weights and then that gives you your lockets. So they say here, they initialize the weights right here. Actually, they initialize the, um, they have no bias term and they initialize the weights by this constant. So plus minus this constant. It's not really necessary to do that, but they do it right here. It makes the analysis also a bit easier. Um, I guess it just works more well. If you have these masks in superposition, of course, you want to add all of these masks with the respective alpha weighting factor, then multiply by the weights, and that gives you your logits. So um, note that this, this doesn't necessarily only, only have to be the last layer's weights right here. Um, you can view that as any sort of weights uh, of the neural network if you formulate this phi correctly. So uh, you don't think that they only apply the mask to the last layer. They do apply the mask to the entire thing. All right, now the, the important part here is what happens if we look at the derivative of G with respect to one of the alphas and take the maximum negative derivative of that G, which is that mysterious function that only looks at the at the um, at the superfluous neurons. So what they want, they kind of construct this G by principle. Um, what they say is, we want a function G that mimics the supervised loss, right? <laughs> we want a function G that is kind of equal like the supervised loss if we had the task ID, right? And that's, that's pretty cool. Because, um, you know, the the supervised loss, you sort of need all the information, you need uh, the label, you need, you need all the all the you need the task ID. So the supervised loss is unavailable. But we want a function g that in its gradient mimics the supervised loss. So they go about constructing this right here. They say, Lemma, first lemma, it's possible to construct a function g such that the gradient matches the gradient from the supervised loss for all s neurons. So for all these superfluous neurons. Specifically, the, we want that the gradient with respect to the logits, if the gradient to the logits is equal, that means the gradient to all the rest of the network is equal because the rest of the network goes through the logits, right? The gradient through the logits is equal to the gradient of the supervised loss to the logits for all the superfluous neurons and zero otherwise. So they say the zero otherwise is pretty easily done um, in math, you know, just simply set it to zero and in the actual code, which you can achieve like this, where m uh, indicates the superfluous neurons. So this is just um, they just multiplied here, and the other ones are detached. So there is no gradient flowing. This is the property that we only look at the superfluous neurons. And now we are going to show that the gradient is going to be equal. Um, so they say if you had the supervised loss, which means if you had the label, then this would be your cross entropy loss. Okay, so you cross it divides into this part where you need the label. And then this part here, you don't need the label. Now, you can, you can pretty say pretty much say, look, it, the label is certainly going to be one of not the superfluous neurons, because the superfluous neurons are superfluous, they are never the correct neuron. <laughs> so this is always going to be, you know, not the not the neurons we look at. So the gradient, certainly, this is always going to be zero. Uh, because we never we wherever the gradient is flowing, that's not where the uh, where this is one. So the gradient of any superfluous neuron is just this thing right here. And that's exactly why they build the function g. So the function g has this exact gradient, the function g, if you derive it has that same gradient as the supervised um, loss for the superfluous neurons. 
okay? So it's, it's sort of magic, um, but it's not, you know, it's not magic. So they need two more assumptions here um, to have to get the following properties. So the, for the first property, now because now we want to have G be identifying the correct task. So we've already constructed G, now we want to show that if we really do this, the gradient with respect to the alphas, then um, if we do it for a wrong task, for the task that uh, it's not the task of that particular data point that goes into computing G, then we'll get a value that's probably lower than zero. However, if we plug in, if we derive but with respect to the alpha of the correct task, then we get a gradient, a negative gradient that's higher than zero. Okay, so we're now going to prove that this with high probability really allows us to distinguish the correct task uh, from the wrong task. And we need two assumptions right here. Um, assumption one is we assume that the mask learned on task i will be independent from the data from task j. If the task data is from task j, then this are independent random variables. Okay, so it sort of means that the um, the tasks themselves are kind of independent. Uh, but it's not it's it's not the same requirement. But you can think of in in the case of permuted mnist or so, uh, this is some it's given except if you consider this uh, kind of uh, frequency of brightness and so on. But if you have independent task, I think that this is given. Um, that means that the, the features right here and the mask are independent variable. If, if the data is from task J, then the features and the mask from task I are independent variable, sorry. The second assumption you need is that we assume that a negative weight and a positive weight are equally likely to be masked out. Okay, so this again, you can uh, think of with some regularity, uh, this is certainly going to be to be given in a randomly initialized neural network. Um, note that when the features are uh, zero, which will be the case for zero mean random features. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, before I said this was your neural network, this is your random neural network, right? And then you mask that and so on. Um, if this is a randomly initialized neural network, then you can make a case that the expected features of those will be zero. It doesn't need to be the case, but um, you can you can construct it such that it is. So if you have the two things, right, if you have those two things, then you can prove the following. If the data x comes from task j, then when you derive by an alpha that's not of task j, you get a number that's smaller than zero in expectation. And here, the crucial part is you reframe this gradient, you reframe, reframe, reframe. And what you'll see is that this here comes out. So this is a sum and each element of the sum is going to be greater or equal to zero, which means that this thing is greater or equal to zero, which means the negative thing is smaller than zero in lemma h1. Now we're going to look at lemma h1 to get an intuition of what's going on right here. So lemma h1 says if j is the true task, and i is not equal to j, then this quantity here is greater than zero. All right, I restarted my tablet and we are back. So um, what's kind of the the intuition behind uh, why this quantity here would be greater or equal to zero. And uh, honestly, in order to make it a bit easier, I first want to look at um, whenever i equals j. So whenever j is the true task, and then i equals j, then we can sort of think of the opposite, like why, why this should be smaller or equal to zero. So consider this, this is the run the feature of the network uh, of u, right? And then the euv connects that to the um, to the mask at point v and the mask at point at uh, that point uv is either zero or one depending on the training. So this 
this xi right here, um, that's going to be the from the initialization, but the mask is going to be zero or one, depending on whether that feature contributes, sorry, whether this entire thing here contributes positively to the task or not. So the secret right here, why we can make a claim that this is greater or lower than zero is going to be that the mask can only be zero or one, it cannot be negative one, right? Um, so if the mask is zero, then obviously, this thing is going to be zero. However, if the mask is one, what does it mean? If the mask is one, that means that this, this entire feature right here, let's call it F, um, is positively impacting um, is positively contributing to this particular neuron right here. So if the mask is one, uh, this is this it means the addition of that feature more of that feature makes that log it go up. Okay, so <laughs> if the mask is one during training, um, it means that the, the feature positively contributes to the task. So if we look at the gradient with respect to this function with respect to the, the log it and the function basically means it's just measure measures how high these superfluous log it's are. Um, then what wh wh why do we find a negative interaction there? Because if you look at the neural network and you forward pass, and this particular feature is important. Um, and you look at the loss g and you backward pass through the log its, if it is smaller than zero, that means that there is a negative interaction right here. So that basically means that um, if we make this feature higher, then in this case, we make this g function go lower. Okay, and that is the case for the correct task, because if this is the correct task, and the mask is learned adequately, that means it should assign a low weight to the superfluous neuron, whenever the input features, you know, are of that task. And so it makes sense that this here would be a negative number, because what we want, if the mask deems the feature important in a positive sense, we want that if the feature goes up, g goes down. And that's ex exactly why we have the negative interaction right here, right? So the negative comes from this being negative. I hope this sort of makes sense. So if the mask is one, the mask says, basically, if that feature goes up, the loss goes down. Now G is a measure of the superfluous neurons, the superfluous neurons should be small, if the loss is small. Um, so if this is really from the task, and this feature is really useful, that means if we increase the feature, the G function should go down. And therefore, this product here is going to be most likely negative. Okay. And the contrary is, you know, analogous right here, if this is not of this task, um, the mass can either be zero or one, right? If it's zero, then this quantity is zero. However, if it's one, it's more likely that the um, that there, the feature here, because it's, I is not the correct task, which basically means that um, this feature, it is for a different task, it is good for a different task. So the mask of that different task says it's good right here. And we have no reason to believe that this would decrease the loss of the loss of this particular data point in this task. So it's kind of the inverse reasoning. Um, if you look at the actual derivation here, it's fairly long. And um, it goes over the cases of the interactions between actually this initialization and the mask. So the initialization can be positive, or negative, as you can see, right here. And um, I think I just think that the the intuition here is that um, the superfluous neurons react differently to a data point of the trained task, because they have been kind of uh, made to decrease for that task. 
and for that particular mask as they do for when the data point doesn't match the mask. When the data point doesn't match the mask, there is no reason for the logits of the superfluous neurons to be low. And if the data point task does match the mask, there is ample reasons for those to be low. I hope that sort of makes sense. Um, it is sort, it's a bit more of an intuition, but uh, if you really want to dig into it, look at the derivation right here. Okay, second point is the fact that the masks and the superpositions don't really have to do anything with each other. And that's, you know, I've, I've said throughout the video, like, remember, these tasks are super easy, yada, yada, yada. So let me make it clear um, in this in this diagram right here, the super masks, these are simply a way to train a neural network in a crude way, right? I don't think there is, you know, th this distinction between mask and network. Um, I don't really like that much, because ultimately, what you're doing is simply you're training a neural network in a kind of weird way. Okay, the fact that you always use the same underlying, you know, gray neural network doesn't really matter right here. Um, it's still what you do in the super mask training is you provide a severely over parameterized network, and then the mask simply gets to choose which weights to mix rather than you get to adjust the weights. If you adjust the weights, you usually get more accurate than with the mask, but it's sort of like a quantized neural network that you train right here. So that's the super mask thing. Again, I don't think it's important that the underlying network is always the same. The only advantage you have is it saves space, uh, because the, these masks are very small. Um, the super masks, on the other hand, this idea that you overlay all of the masks together, and then you look at where this um, at the gradient of the entropy, and you look at which of the of the mixing factors the gradient pulls the most, um, that's a different idea. And the question here is, wouldn't that isn't that independent? Does it really depend on the masks? Or doesn't it? Uh, and the, you know, the hypothesis would be that if I simply train, you know, three different neural networks for three different tasks, could I not do the same superposition trick? Like, could I not just add all of them with a respective alpha, look at the entropy, uh, calculate the gradient with respect to each of the alphas of the entropy, and then decide which task it is, you know, don't need masks, simply mix neural networks in superposition. So <laughs> I did it. And I actually tried their code is available. So big props for their code being available. I tried their code. Uh, it's actually very few changes. And I'm going to append my live coding of this at the end of this video. Uh, so if you want to, if you are interested in watching that, you can do so. But you know, the outcome is if I train neural networks, and I have, I've, you know, done super quick, um, and initialized them wrongly, probably and all. But if I train these neural net, if I train the masks, you get to like 92% accuracy in their tasks, uh, in each of the tasks, and then also in the average. If I train the actual neural networks, I get to a higher accuracy, like 93 something, it, it doesn't matter, it's just higher. Okay, so that's hypothesis one is the training masks is just a way of training neural networks, the fact that the masks and the network training itself are that close, I think is a testament to how easy these tasks are, like how easy Mnet, Amnist is, um, I'm going to also hypothesize that if the task gets harder and harder, and I don't mean 10 class image net, I mean, a 1000 class image net, um, then these masks are going to degrade severely versus training the actual neural network, I might be wrong, I mean, you can over parameterize uh, really heavily, and they will still work. Okay, but in any case, I trained the, trained these neural networks, and they reached higher accuracy. And then I did the exact same thing, I laid them in superposition to determine what task it is, and I could achieve the exact same result. So here in their example, they have 100% task classification accuracy, and I reached the exact same thing code worked. Um, I'm not going to try to scale this up to 250 or 2500 in tasks, but I'm going to assume that with, you know, tuning and stuff um, that it's going to work about equally well, you could make an argument that the masks being sparser, uh, they might be differentiated from each other more accurately. But I'm not sure. Um, maybe, 
but it's it's not a qual it's not a qualitative difference, right? So these two things are really two separate ideas that find their way together in this paper, but ultimately have uh, not much to do with each other. Okay, um, at least that's uh, from what I can tell. I might I might be wrong here, and I might be wrong with respect to their G objective and whatnot. And um, you know, but I think that that these are two cool ideas, um, but they can be applied independently. So. Uh, the last thing I want to look at is their broader impact statement right here. Now, there is a reason. So usually, I kind of track these broader impact statement because I think this this is this here is sort of fundamental research, right? This is fundamental machine learning research, uh, we do architecture, we do multitask learning task isn't really important, as long as we have kind of the same tasks right here uncorrelated and so on the same hardness and I've also made the point that it's really important for these tasks to be the same hard for this to work and this plays a role right here. So um, and they do they do describe some of this in this conclusion with you know, um, limitation that we observed has to do with task identity inference when models are not well calibrated models that are overly confident for the wrong task. Okay. So in order for them to infer the correct task, um, they, the sort of, so if you look at your entropy of the models for the tasks, that means you're going to select the model that is the most sure about the task. This only works if the tasks are equally hard, okay, if one task is much, much harder than the other task, this other task is always going to say, well, I'm really confident about this one, because the task is just easier, it's going to be, it's going to train a neural network that's generally more confident, and you're going to misclassify a lot of the tasks. So, so here, um, what does this have to do with the broader impact statement? If you look at the broader impact statement, what they say right here, um, so they say, a goal of continued learning self many tasks with a single model, however, it is not exactly clear what qualifies as a single model, therefore, a concrete objective has become to learn many tasks as efficiently as possible. We believe that sub sub is a useful step in this direction. However, there are consequences to more efficient models, both positive and negative. So this is sort of what the community does. So there are three things that I've seen so far in broader impact statement. First, you some people say this is not applicable to us, which I agree for most fundamental research, broader, if like the broader impact statement is supposed to be what does this particular method, how will this influence broader society. So not applicable, uh, completely valid for most of these um, research papers, because guess what, you can use any method to do good or to do bad. And that's, that's the second, second part. Second method is basically, you, you just ch say some generic statements, how you can do good and bad. And usually, you can't relate it to your particular method in the paper, right? Uh, because your method is, I don't know, like my, my faster convergence rate of SGD. Um, but and, and so what you do is you just go one level up, you go up the levels, so it's like optimization can be used for good and for bad. I mean, that's still kind of a bit vague. And then you go up further. Well, optimization can do more machine learning. And machine learning can be used to do good and bad, for example, face recognition and things like this. So you just go up the levels. And that's what they essentially do here. And that's what, you know, most people have defaulted to. It's like, okay, um, so, you know, our model here is, you know, we, it basically one can train more efficient models. And then they simply highlight what more efficient models can do. Efficient models require less compute. Efficient model by be run on the end device. Um, if models are more efficient, then large scale research is not limited to wealthier institutions. By the way, I also the broader impact statement, I believe should be the impact on society, and not really on the research community itself. Uh, so I also this, this, um, is a bit shaky with respect to so I'm really regarding what the broader impact statement should be. This is not my opinion. I'm, I'm trying to reflect 
everything I've read of guidance about what the broader impact statement should be. By the way, there is also uh, method, um, method three, which is to simply tell me more about your paper in the broader impact statement, which I guess is the smart method because the broader impact statement can be before the, before the references. So it's in the main part and people are required to read it. Not like the appendix. Uh, reviewers are not required to read the appendix. Reviewers are required to read the broader impact statement. So I guess the smart authors will just try to cloak more information about their model in terms of a broader impact statement, I guess. Well, whether that's smart is a different um, discussion. But here, they just it's, it's already defaulting, right? These it's already the default people simply go level up level up level up until we can you know say something generic and we would also highlight and discuss the negative consequences of models which can efficiently learn many tasks and efficient models in general when models are more efficient they're also more available and less subject to regularization as a stu and study of result for instance when a high impact model is released, an institution will hopefully be accompanied by a model card analyzing the bias and intended use of the model. By contrast, if anyone is able to train a powerful model, this may no longer be the case, resulting in a proliferation of model with harmful biases or intended use. Taking the United States, for instance, bias can be harmful as models show disproportionately more errors for already marginalized groups furthering existing deeply rooted structural racism this 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 is like well technology this is basically a statement about technology um and so why why do i have a particular not issue but why do i pick this broader impact statement they even this here this is this gender shades paper right where people went and they looked at these commercial APIs for face recognition. I, th I think that's the paper. Um, yeah, gender shades. So if you have a face recognizer, uh, they realized they divided people up by, I think, gender and race. Um, so, uh, you know, gen like they, they built four groups or I haven't, I haven't, uh, I've just looked at the paper, but in my understanding that they divided people up into groups, which I find arbitrary to have the these two axes, race and gender, but okay, you can do that. And they discovered that these commercial APIs have different accuracy for the different groups, right? And that basically our point is that, you know, these commercial APIs, if they're offered for all humans, they should work equally well for all humans. Now, <laughs> Now you maybe see what it has to do with this paper. Well, this paper is in the business of doing multitask learning. So it is very viable to actually frame the, the task for example. Like this is an example. If you frame the task of multitask learning, like face recognition on different groups of people as a multitask learning problem. You have, you know, group group one right here, group two, group three, and then if at inference time, so you can build, you know, good models for each of the group. At inference time, you're given an image and you're trying to infer first which group is that from and then take the appropriate classifier. That would be, you know, that would be a good a hypothetical classifier for this thing. Now, what do we know about this thing? This thing is fails if the tasks aren't equally hard. Also, in, in specifically, if, if for one group, let's say for group three, the, the task is way harder because you have less data. Um, I guess the, the one of the main problems there is that the data sets are not equally balanced. If you have less data for that, then the task becomes de facto harder and the model is less sure about the task, which means that it's a double whammy. So not only is the model itself less accurate, but these, the input data point, if the person is actually of group three, is less likely to be classified correctly into the correct model at to begin with. So, you know, for all the, for all, 
I, I've had my, my share of, of comments on the video I made and I still maintain that societal bias can comes about by data set. But for all the people saying there are models that exaggerate uh, existing uh, biases in models, this would be like if there is any ever any applicability of these broader impact statement guidelines, this would be the paper, right? It's this right here is an actual system that if I have different classifiers and I combine them with this method, it will double punish the classifier that is less sure, that is less accurate, because that is also going to be the one with the higher entropy, therefore not as much selected if I give a data point of that particular task. And so this is like a, I'm not criticizing the method here, like by all means, like this is a cool method um, where you can recognize that this happens and try to calibrate accordingly. But if there was ever any straight ball for a broader impact statement, <laughs> I would, you know, this is it. And uh, this, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not saying that these, these authors didn't do that for a reason. I, I believe that, look, it's been, whatever, not even half a year since we've started with these general broader impact statements. And everybody is already defaulting to simply say technology good, technology bad. That's, that's, that, like, people aren't even thinking. And so this, right, this is one of the reasons why I simply find these broader impact statements to be not that like not a good idea because there is a default answer and people are just putting it here even in like when there is an actual obvious immensely obvious thing that they even they even cited like the basis for that so you know that's sort of my take on this um i <laughs> Again, I enjoy this paper. The code is is available. Everything is good about this this paper. I'm not even the fact that these are you know I think these are kind of two separate ideas. They're combined. Cool. They're analyzed formally in theory. There's intuition given. Um, all good. So don't get me wrong. Uh, this is not like trashing this paper. Um, it's just I felt I had some. Thing more to say and I think uh, that was it so yeah I'll see you next time with the new paper okay so our goal here is going to be to change this code to uh, not use masks as mixtures but actually use neural networks with real weights as as mixtures and in superposition with each other okay so what we're going to do is we're going to train the different neural networks and then use this kind of superposition trick to figure out which task a data point came from. So let's have a look at the code right here. And um, there's a bunch of helper code. And if we go down through everything, you'll see that this is the MNIST permuted data set. So each, uh, each task is basically a random permutation of MNIST. And if you execute, I believe this here, and then you train the model. And right now it's for five tasks, but I guess that's going to be enough for now. Um, yeah, so if we get some good signal here, I guess it's, it's a matter of, uh, of doing kind of engineering and plumbing and tuning uh, if until you get it up to whatever 200 or 2000 tasks, though, I might be wrong there. So this is training and I short, sort, of, sort of had a look at the code, but I haven't actually tried this uh, yet. So the thing, the model is built here. You see there's this multitask fully connected, which has these different layers right here. And it's built by these multitask mask linear uh, models. Now the multitask mask linear models are defined right here. Um, so it's basically a linear model, as you can see, it's derived from a linear, um, from a linear module. And it has a parameter called num tasks, and then it has a parameter scores, which I guess is, um, are these, these masks right here. And the scores, I'm going to guess are always going to be multiplied by the weights here in the forward. Um, so you can see 
they're in the forward you get the weights from the alphas um yeah yeah this is the superimposed all right so if we know the task id down here we get this subnet and we are going to multiply it with the weights if we don't know the task id we want to get these alphas so the alphas are going to be one over the number of tasks at the beginning um, we're then going to multiply each of the alphas with the weights and with that um, we're going to get this subnet mask right here so we need to know what this self.stacked is so this self.stacked is getting right here in this cache mask um, we're simply stacking this this get subnet for all of the things so our plan is going to be that this subnet right here is going to be the actual weights of the neural network okay and not just the um not just the mask and then we don't need to actually multiply it with the weight we can just just forget about the weight honestly and uh just train the subnet so for the subnet as you can see here you have this get subnet thing and that's an autograd function which basically means in the forward pass you want to discretize it and in the backward pass this is a straight through estimator so our first task is going and this here should be done now my laptop has stopped breathing so we've trained five tasks and now we can run inference on that so this is when the task is given um, real quick you can see task one 92 percent 92 percent 92 percent 92 percent so we have a an overall performance of 92.44 percent then when the task is not given we have two things to evaluate whether or not um, basically how good we are overall and whether or not we get the tasks correct of course the tasks correct is a pre-requirement so we have a hundred percent task inference accuracy okay so um we don't we don't okay we can we could evaluate this here but you can already see the output from last time there is like no difference from the performance of the when the task is given it's always being able to infer the task we want to check out the same thing so we want to change first of all this get subnet this is where it's these scores are discretized now given that these scores are going to be end to end up being our actual weights we won't we don't do that we simply return the scores now this is a, this is pretty pointless right now but um we'll keep it just to be as close as possible uh to the to that now mask in it um this is where we initialize the mask now this is kyming uniform and it has some thing but we want probably we want to train the neural network to be initialized you know as we know it so let's try what what are other initialized functions so init dot what do we have here do we have what's usual I don't even know normal uh Xavier that that sounds about right that sounds about right all right all right so scores and yeah let's try this this could this could like break everything right if you initialize wrongly you get like dumb results so okay um signed constant yada 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 where is that used huh okay uh that's also initializing something so we calculate the gain and then okay this doesn't seem good we'll just keep it hey why not um <laughs> why not why not just keep it at that all right so cool um oh yeah this is for the weight anyway we won't use the weight at all of this layer we'll just use our own weights so here we have these stacked okay we get the scores that's all good like i'm pretty happy with that um i'm pretty happy with this mask in it that we make our parameters so these are going to be our different neural networks that we train um this all looks good the alphas look good 
Now, the only thing we want to do, honestly, is just to have not the weight times the subnet here, but the subnet as such, like this. Is this it? Do we now train actual neural networks? I, <laughs> I have my doubts, honestly. Like, there should be... No, this should be it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just try it. Like, we're gonna get a mistake somewhere, like a crash. Nope, nope. Okay. All right. <laughs> we're actually training. So, for real, like, um, these scores right here, the fact what made them a mask is that we discretized them right here. So we made them into a mask right here. We're not doing that anymore. So we're just training floats. And then we're also not multiplying it by the weight, we are just using those floats, which means that we are using the um, a, a, a basically a neural network. And then here the bias, uh, I was worried about the bias, but the bias is always zero, as you can see here. So the bias is always false. Um, yeah, so we're training five different neural networks for five different tasks. Um, and, you know, according to my hypothesis, these mask things are just kind of crude, quantized ways of training neural networks. And if, if my hypothesis is correct, this here is going to turn out probably even better than uh, this masked thing. Okay, so last task training right here. Laptop starting to breathe. Good laptop. Fast laptop. Very nice. Come on, come on, come on. And we're done. So again, we have an average top one performance of 92 point. Is this, e did I even, oh no, I ran this right here. Okay. <laughs> Like that's the exact same number it was last time. So we need to run inference again. And if we're given the task ID, then we are at 93.9%. So we increase slightly, um, which might just be due to the fact that we initialize terribly, terribly. Okay, so what does it say about our task inference accuracy? Maybe there's some mask here. Set model task, the alphas are to one. Nope. No, we're good. We're good. Task inference accuracy 100%. And I'm going to guess, well, with the task inference accuracy being 100%, I'm going to guess this here will give us the exact same number, uh, like the 93 point some percent. So, yeah, 93.9%. So I'm, you know, I'm going to say right here that the on the super masks and the superposition really are two separate ideas, right? Um, you, uh, it's, it's because the paper is like, it sounds cool and all with the super mask and superposition, but this inference using the uh, superposition and then the entropy to decide uh, is really one idea and training different super masks, the, the, the advantage in using super mask is, of course, that the model is way smaller. Um, so you can remember it much more easily. But also, you know, the, it's really different. It, there's, it has nothing to do with the superposition. Yeah, all right. So I'm going, I'm going to guess this also works for, you know, 200 tasks and whatnot, the higher uh, order of tasks. Um, so I think that's it and we're done here. Yeah.